is risen indeed. And hey, um, my name is Joe Richards, and I'm the substitute. And I came up with something. I, it was pretty cool. I, I just it was like a new thing for me. Um, I know that we pray for our pastor, and we know why you know God blesses him and, and uses him. But sometimes I just I get a lot of joy from being able to be a substitute, and I think I know why. When there's a substitute, people not just pray, but they pray and they fast. So thank you for that. I need all the prayer I can get. Pastor Tom, I said, Pastor Tom, what should I pray on while you're ministering up there in, in Wisconsin behind the cheese curtain? And he said, whatever God puts on your heart. I said, you want me to carry on with James? He goes, if you want to do that, you can do that. So whatever God puts on your heart. So I, um, I'm going to carry on with James. But the Lord's put a couple of other passages on my heart as well. And there's basically three primary texts that we're going to take a look at today. Uh, one is in James chapter 5, where we left off. And if you want to stick your bulletin in this one, just to be ready for it, uh, Luke chapter 12 is the other, and Matthew chapter 27. Those are the three places we're going to be. I was trying to come up with a title for this message, but it was a struggle, and I think Brian, who has control of the visuals, has come up with something else from within the message, but originally I called it Previews of the Day of the Lord, and the Day of the Lord, as you know, is the final judgment and the end of the world, and our Savior's wonderful victory. We want to focus on that for sure. Um, but I also thought that really what I'm trying to say, I think, this morning is that we should live with a sense of a sense of worshipful joyful urgency now some people have urgency but it means that they're stress carriers and they're always in a panic and they're panic carriers I don't want that I don't I don't think the Lord wants us being panic people either and and that that sort of uh, the fruit of the spirit doesn't strike me as being stress carrying um, but to live loosely, to hold our hands, you know, to not grasp life and, and to, to use every opportunity we have for his glory because the days are evil. And uh, to work while it's still light and while we can still work because it's a privilege to serve our Lord. And I thought, just to get some of the wicked stuff out of the way, and I think I can do this pretty fast, I thought I would give an introduction because James in chapter 5, verse 1, is talking about some horrible things going on in his day that he feels pretty powerless to do anything about. You know, they didn't have this uh, representative uh, form of government. They didn't have a legal system that you could make appeals to. And uh, a lot of times um, they say might makes right. Might doesn't make right. Might just makes might. <laughs> and people get away with things, and it's not right. But anyway, I was thinking about things that kind of stress me out, and I was thinking of these. These are some of the things that may, may stress you out, too. The stock market drop. The supply chain. Energy. Food shortages. Fertilizer shortages. Cyber currency. Silver and gold changes. Uh, Gates is farmland. He's probably buying it to keep BlackRock from getting it for the house. Anti-Semitism in Israel. There's been more terrorist attacks in Israel in the last four months than in the previous four years. What about North Korea? There's a sweet bunch. You know, they've launched 15 intercontinental ballistic missiles in the last four months. Several this last week, one from a submarine. Oh, that's, that makes me feel real good. Um... Iran getting a centrifuge and probably being weeks from having a nuclear weapon, not uh, not months. China repeatedly violating airspace over Taiwan. Of course, Russia, Ukraine, and of course the Russians may sense that there's natural gas down to the south, and that could precipitate the Ezekiel War in chapter 38. And isn't that a happy thought? Not. Um, or what about the 2,000 mules? Or what about the CDC getting ready to tell us what the next variant is and whether or not we have to be locked out? Okay, there, I did it. Everybody all stressed out on an empty stomach? That's bad, bad, bad. He'll never substitute again. <laughs> well, James, James is talking about some bad situations too, but you know what? I know we're already in James, and you got an introduction to it, but I think it's helpful to get another little brief introduction. Who is James? Now, this is weird. 
uh, and you probably aren't used to thinking of it this way, but James is the younger brother of Jesus, half-brother, half-brother of Jesus, because Jesus was born of a virgin. That's a miracle. And uh, after Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary, Mary had other kids. One's Jude, wrote a book of the Bible. One's James. But you know what? Something interesting about James, during that time when Jesus was physically on earth before his death and resurrection, uh, his family, including James, uh, pretty much ridiculed him and marginalized him. Not his mother. Um, I'd like to think Joseph didn't, too. But, uh, but you know, um, it says that there were times when they thought he was nuts. And there were times when his brethren told him in John chapter 6, go on up to the feast. They're trying to kill you. Go on up anyway. And that's not very nice. But James converted to faith in Jesus after the resurrection, which is interesting because when Jesus was crucified, it says he was beat so badly he almost didn't even look human on the cross. But when he appeared to James at the resurrection, James recognized him. And James grew so fast he became a church leader in the church of Jerusalem. And he was known as being called camel knees. Have you ever heard that? James was called camel knees. And the reason was because he was so devoted to prayer. And I think part of the reason he was so devoted to prayer was that he believed that Jesus could come again at any moment and that he was humbled by the way he treated his half-brother <laughs> and uh, just spent a lot of time talking to him in prayer. I think that's uh, very interesting. But let's, let's read in our Bibles. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be reading in the New International Version. So if you don't have that version, your version reads a little bit different. You can follow along on the screen. I've highlighted some things I'm going to highlight in the text. But if you'd like to uh, read in your own hard copy of a Bible and you don't have one with you, slip up your hand and somebody will get one to you. So if you need one, just raise that up. And I'm going to jump right on into our text. So the last call for Bibles. Okay, James chapter 1. Now listen, you rich people. Notice I have rich highlighted up there in kind of a brownish yellow text. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fatted yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not even opposing you. Let's just take a pause there. This is the book of James. We are carrying on with the book of James. And he's talking about a class of people. And they are not... Believers. Believers are going to be addressed in the next verse, verse 7. See that? Be patient, brothers and sisters. But before we get to that, just to highlight a few things here. These are wealthy uh, people called the rich, verse 1, the wealthy in verse 2, gold and silver. It's easy for us to look at a text like this and immediately superimpose our understanding of critical theory and say, well, this is clearly, it's, it's, it's a class struggle, right? The rich have always been the bad guys, and the poor are always good. Well, that's not, that didn't even enter into the mind of James. Uh, and it's not money that is the problem. Yes, money does have a, an innate kind of power that reveals where our heart is, but it is the love of money that is the root of all evil, not having resources. And we can be glad as North American Americans uh, uh, that that's true because we're pretty wealthy by the world's standards of things. Um, but this, this wealth, this gold and silver that they are hoarding onto, this category of people, they're using it to oppress people and to keep people in suffering. Can you imagine having this wealth and not even paying the people who mow your fields? I mean, they've been working in the hot sun, and they don't, doesn't say you cheat them or what, you don't pay them anything. Well, you're not going to eat if you're poor and you don't get your day's wage. Uh, that is nasty behavior. But look at the other thing I've highlighted here in blue in our text. I don't know if we can kind of back up the scroll and see it, but there's an emphasis James is making here in that um, 
we shouldn't be tempted to take matters into our own hands. Have you heard this expression before? Don't take the law into your own hands. There's a reason for that. There's a thing called due process. There are people called police officers who are trained to do, there's things like juries and such things. They didn't have a lot of it in James's day, but you know, even as a parent, you can have a bad day at the office or at work or factory, or wherever you are, classroom, come home in a bad mood. One of the kids apparently misbehaves and you harshly punish them just to find out a few hours later that actually what they were doing was actually the better thing. And it was the other kid that was actually the instigator of the whole situation. And you just, you haven't sought the Lord on it. You overreacted and found out you made some bad decisions. Well, James is saying in this text, look, something is coming. Something's on the way. There's an old song by Kansas called, Hold On, Baby, Hold On. There's something on the way. Your tomorrow's not the same as today. And I think it's singing about Jesus coming. I really do. I think Kerry Libgren already had that in his heart. But look, something's coming on verse 1. Misery is coming to you for this kind of behavior, wealthy, oppressive people. And your, your wealth and your silver are corroded, and they will testify against you, the future, and eat your flesh like fire. Sounds like a coming judgment to me. And you've hoarded wealth in the last days. See that at the bottom of verse 3 there? Last days in Scripture is talking about that period of time from Jesus' resurrection until the rapture of the church, his second coming for his people, the church. That's all the last days. But James is expecting it could happen at any moment. And guess what? That's what the New Testament teaches, that Jesus' coming could happen at any moment. And that's why I'm pre-trib. And you may not be, you may be, I don't know, but that's something for me. I just held to that view because I think Jesus could come at any moment. Look, verse 4, the wages you failed to pay the workers, they're crying out, and they're reaching the ears of the Lord Sabaoth is actually what it says in the Greek. And Lord Sabaoth is a name for God that means the God of the armies of heaven. In other words, judgment's coming. <clears throat> The Lord of the armies of heaven is going to come and wreak havoc on this bad behavior. And look at down at the end of verse 5. It's going to happen in the day of slaughter. James is teaching that we should trust in the sovereignty of God. The last chapter, as far as our living and out perspective, has not been written yet. We don't know how God may work these things out, but we can pray about them. We can seek God. We can seek for justice. We can seek for understanding, and we can serve him with our resources now. We can pray. We can share scripture. We can witness. We can practice hospitality and generosity, but we don't know how the story ends. But actually, as believers, we do know how the story ends because we've read the Bible, and Jesus is the victor. He conquers the grave. He conquers death. He conquers injustice. He is coming again. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So it doesn't matter if you're a renter or if you're a property manager or if you're a land owner. None of it ultimately belongs to you. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he's going to get his stuff back. And this text teaches rather clearly that James is quite expectant about that. And I believe that it teaches that we should be expectant. Also, let's carry on reading in James chapter 5 through verse 8. Be patient then, brothers and sisters. Oh, now he's talking to Christians. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Did I mention that James talks about the second coming of Christ for his people? Did I mention that James talks about the coming justice and he's living as if it could happen anymore? Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. Patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. You too, be patient. Stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. You know, used to say things to each other as they were sometimes thrown to the lion's den for persecution under Rome. They would shout out a word of encouragement to each other. Christ is risen. And they would say, Maranatha, which means the Lord is coming soon. And 
that's called uh, eminence in uh, theological terms. Not immanence, like uh, holding things together, but imminent, like ready to happen, like ready to tip at any time. Well, I'm going to turn your attention to a, another passage of, of Scripture. Make sure I'm okay here with a... Oh, yeah. I... Turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. A lot of times people don't really know this about James because it seems like it's all a book about works as if we save ourselves by our works. You can't save yourself by your works. You can't save yourself by your tears. You can't save yourself, period. <laughs> it's a work of God's grace to the work of Christ, which we appropriate by trusting the work that he has done. And that, that this is what the gospel is all about. But James, even though it seems like such a practical book full of uh, teachings, actually is permeated by the uh, Beatitudes. You know the Beatitudes? Blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the poor in spirit. You can find all of them in the book of James. I'll give you a little assignment to go and look for that sometime because uh, it's pretty amazing. Even though James was rejecting Jesus during his lifetime and repented at his resurrection, uh, the teaching still reaches him and comes on fire. Well, this is another teaching that I think overlaps with James, and it's from the words of Jesus in Luke 12, starting in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, 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 tell my brother, divide the inheritance with me. I don't know if you noticed, but inheritance probably has to do with money and wealth. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. What is greed? Craving something that's more than what you need. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Interesting, isn't it? Let's take a little pause there. Just, just I'm gonna tell you a quick little parable of um, the liberal. I sometimes identify myself as a classical liberal. I wanna be widely read, consider different points of view, but I'm not an ideological liberal. And sometimes I consider myself a conservative, but not the red, white, and blue all the time, Americanism kind of thing. But this is kind of a story about a liberal and a conservative. And it's a parable about a guy that's drowning. Okay, So this man is drowning off the edge of this pier. He can't swim. And he's going down. He's suffocating. I mean, <coughs> the guy is going to die. And the one guy sees it, and he says, I'm going to save that guy. So he goes and he gets a rope, and he throws it out to the guy, but he throws the end of the rope just about five feet away from him, so the guy will take a little initiative and swim over to it, and then he'll pull him in, right? That's a conservative. Uh, the liberal sees what's happening, and he's going to save the day. So he gets the rope, brings it out, throws it to the drowning man. The drowning man was able to grab it, and he throws in the rest of the rope, too, and goes to look for somebody else to save. That guy's going to drown, too. Here's the gospel. Jesus jumps in the water and pulls us out. It's a different way. It's a different way. It's a different God. It's about the work that God does. Well, let's go on reading here in, in Luke chapter 12. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Now, just look at these pronouns. You can see it if you're following on the text. I've got them highlighted there in that yellowish thing. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink and be merry. Well, this is not kingdom living. This is grasping living. 
And the Bible teaches we lose our life to find it. And if you try to grasp it and hold it and clench it, you are going to lose it. And there's a lot of graspers in this world that are desperate for their health insurance. They're desperate for their this. They're desperate for their that. And they're, they're hoarding up stuff just like this guy. And you, you can't live that way. Well, you can, but it's, it's destructive. In verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Let's take a pause there. People will say to me, Joe, I disagree with you on that rapture thing. Fine, fine. It's not a central doctrine uh, um, on the time because I don't believe Jesus could come at any moment. You don't? Okay, well, that's fine. I, where, I don't see how you see that in Scripture, but okay, what, what are you, where are you coming from? Oh, I think the church is going to go through persecution. Yeah, the church is going to go through persecution. Here's something for you to consider. This very night, your life could be demanded of you. <laughs> it could happen at any minute. Well, then you're going to say, oh, oh, God, but you must have made a mistake because I didn't go through persecution. Well, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Amen. Live your life full on for Jesus right now. You'll find it coming back to you. People tell me they don't believe in Christian apologetics, giving a reason for the hope that you have. You know why they don't believe in apologetics? Giving a reason for why they believe? Because they aren't sharing their faith with anybody. Because if you share your faith with people today who are unchurched, they're going to have questions, and they're going to have some pushback. And so you've got to be ready. But Jesus says in this text, this very night your life will demand it of you. You don't know how long you have. I talked to a lady this morning who had a report that she may have cancer, went to the doctor and just got a clean bill of health. As far as she knows, there's no cancer in her body. Answer to prayer. I'm rejoicing with her in that. But you know what I said to her? I like how you said that. As far as you know, there is no cancer in your body. They say every man over the age of 40 has got prostate cancer. It's just probably not going to be the thing that kills you. Guess what? We are going to die. We are all going to die. Our life is terminal. It's because of Garden of Eden, and it's because of our own sin as well. There's only one generation that says that the Bible says uh, those who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and I hope it's this one, and I kind of think it will be. There's an awful lot of signs about that. But listen, let's go on with the parable here to see what Jesus' point is in this text. You fool this very night, you, you hoarder, your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. All right. I have to say this, and I, I know that people are going to say, oh, you're singling out somebody. I'm not singling out anybody. I have a lot of friends who are preppers to various degrees of prepdom. <laughs> yes, I did make that word up. Um, there, there are people, there, I remember the news used to say, you know, you should be prepared if there's a tornado, an earthquake, a natural disaster, a flood. You should have a couple weeks uh, food supply in, in reserves. And you know what? If you're living in a small efficiency apartment, you don't have a place for a big freezer. Uh, you probably don't have that. But when you go grocery shopping, I'm guessing that you probably don't just shop for the meal you're going to go home and eat so that you have to go grocery shopping again in five minutes. There's a thing called a cupboard, and you have some inventory in there for the food that you're going to eat that week. Okay, this is the Bible talks about it in Proverbs saying, go to the ant, you sluggard, and, and, and be prepared. Other people, they're trying to prepare for months. Some are preparing for years. There are people I know that are preparing for seven years because they think we're going to. And, and there are communities, uh, cultic communities out west, that prepare for longer periods of times as well. This kind of thing, I think, develops a mindset. Now, uh, again, on the scale, where you are on the scale of prepperdom, uh, inventory, what's in your freezer, <laughs> I, I don't care. This is the con your conscience before God. But what I do care about is your soul. And, and the soul that is, is striving to hoard up, to take life easy, or for a retirement account, or for whatever it is, uh, the market could go any direction at any time. 
You, you don't know. You, you don't have an entitlement to this kind of mentality. And it, it does foster or can, can foster greed as opposed to generosity. Because if you have stuff, right, you're not broadcasting it saying, hey, I've got stuff. I got the stuff. It sounds like a drug dealer. <laughs> Dude, I got stuff. No. <laughs> so, hey, I've got guns. I got, and here's where they're hidden. I got them hid real well. The combination is 47, 36. 30, you know, I, I have that combination so the kids won't have it. Johnny, stop the, forget that I said that. You know, people know. And then they're going to come and they're going to get your stuff, right? So now you got to hide your stuff. And this is just, there's, there's a comedian that does stuff about this, but I don't want to go there. But um, and it's not very clean. The, the point is, the point is, we need to be generous people that live with open hands before God, that live our lives in worship, that live our lives in generosity, that are not captive by fear, but are captive by the love and the grace of God so we can extend it to other people instead of being a stress-carrying, hoarder, greedy, quote, self-made but actually self-deceived person. You see... Death for the Christian is a win-win. <laughs> to live is Christ and to die is to gain because to die is to be with Jesus immediately. And that is a wonderful win-win. But if you've only been born once, you've not been born again, then you're going to die twice, physically and then again at the second death, which is a lake of fire, which is not a good place to go. And anybody that's here today that has not been born again by the Spirit of God, you need to do that today. You need to put your trust in Him. Turn from yourself to Him fully. Rely on Him in worship, in praise, in gratitude, because He will set you free. And He's the only one who can because He is the only Savior. I think of people who have heard the gospel time and time again, but are living their life as though it's not true. And the only thing I can liken that to is someone that lives a long, slow dull, painful, suicide existence. And time is not on their side. Time is running out. I saw a post this morning by a friend I hired 30 years ago, graduate from uh, Taylor University. He's 20 years old to work in campus ministry. And he said, I turned 50 today. I looked at his picture and I said, dude, you look old. I just said it to myself because he wasn't with me. Um, but he was a really good campus minister. And I, if I saw him today, I'd just give him a big hug and love to take him out to eat and catch up. But um, I just thought, wow, I remember when he was 20 and he's 50. Man, he's old. And I thought, look in the mirror, dude. Look in the mirror. You're, you got... 20 years on him. You know, this, is, this time is running out. It's, it's, it's not on our side in one sense, but in another sense, there's only one life. It will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. My wife used to have a plaque on the wall. It was meant to be motivational, but I found it kind of guilting. It said, there's enough hours in every day to do the perfect will of God. And that includes the Lord gives his beloved even sleep. And Sabbath day, like day of rest, yes, and fellowship, right? But there's still work to do. And we move through that day, and sin happens. And oop, no longer the perfect day with the perfect will. Um, and that's why we need a Savior. And that's why we need to keep short accounts with him and confessing our sins to keep our attitude right towards the living and true God. He is worthy of that praise. Well, I want to turn your attention to another passage of Scripture, and it's our last big one. It's Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 45. And some of this stuff is fresh in your memory anyway, because it's still kind of the Easter season. But you'll remember some of the context of this that, uh, well, there was a, the Jewish leaders. And you remember the Jewish leaders, they had an illegal trial at night. And I don't want to stereotype all the Jewish leaders, okay, because uh, Joseph of Arimathea, he was a rich man, and he provided a tomb for Jesus. And Nicodemus, he was part of the Sanhedrin, and he was a religious Jewish leader as well, and he was a believer in Jesus Christ. 
But in the main, these Jewish leaders, they did this illegal trial thing. They got false testimony thing. They, they, they were beating up Jesus and these kinds of things. All this is going on. And Pilate, he's there in the, in the trial. And his wife said, have nothing to do with that righteous man. I've been tormented in a dream because of him. But he ends up having something to do with that righteous man anyway. And, and he tries to let him off. He wants to release Baraba. He wants to release Jesus instead of Barabbas. But the leadership incites the crowd to say, crucify Jesus, crucify. You know, you know the story, right? You, you've been there. It's easy to get down on Pilate. It's easy to get down on the religious leaders. It's easy to say, why couldn't they have seen? Why did they run away? Why did the one disciple streak away? naked at the arrest? Why did the other one use his sword to chop off somebody's ears? Why don't they get it? Why don't they get it? But you know what? We don't get it. We, we don't get it. It's like James says in chapter 1, the God's perfect law, the Word of God, is like a mirror. And we look in that thing, and we can see everything's out of place, and then we turn away, and we don't do anything about it. We don't change. We need the Holy Spirit of God to change us from the inside out. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. We need to be, if you don't know Jesus, you need to be asking to be the Lord of your life. Now, I have a friend. I call him a friend, but he's probably not a friend. He's more of an associate. He's not really even an associate. He's kind of an acquaintance. I actually have never met him in person. I've never talked to him audibly. I saw him on social media. He had a poem, and I said, man, I really like that poem. So he said, do you like the poem? I said, yeah. He goes, he goes send me your address. So I sent him his, my address, and he sent me a whole book of his poetry. His name is Tom Fraganino, <laughs> and he lives in Atlanta. And uh, so when I'm thinking about all these people that don't get it, Pilate doesn't get it, the Jewish leaders don't get it, why, why don't they understand, why don't the apostles get it? I'm reminded of this poem, and I'm going to read it to you, because I think it gives a little bit of context about that mirror in James. When I looked into the mirror, I saw Pharaoh looking back. I saw David with Bathsheba. I saw Pilate dressed in black. I saw Peter proudly crowing. I saw idols, calves of gold. I saw Judas with his silver. I saw passions uncontrolled. I saw dogs return to vomit. I saw sows go back to mud. I saw good men turn a blind eye at the sight of baby's blood. I saw all of Joseph's brothers madly digging out that pit, saw disciples seeping soundly, way too many shoes that fit. I saw Cain attacking Abel. I saw Pharisees galore, whitewashed tombs proliferating, most of which I just ignored. Yes, I saw the guilty party, indeed, right before my eyes, but I just kept right on dancing with a million alibis. Isn't that what we tend to do? He has three dots at the end of his poem, as if some time elapsed, and he came back and wrote two more stanzas. I discovered sometime later my dishonesty and spin. It was quite a revelation when I recognized my sin. When I ran out of excuses and confronted the disease, truth the enemy I fled from turned me round upon my knees. And that's how we get turned around on our knees. When we confess our sin before a holy God, ask for forgiveness and ask him to forgive us and to be merciful to us. He is a wonderful Savior. Well, let's read this passage in Matthew chapter 27 beginning in verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came on all the land. I gotta take a pause there. Excuse me? 12 o'clock noon till three in the afternoon and darkness over all the land? I mean, try to explain that one scientifically. I'm sorry, eclipses don't last that long. I came up with a scientific theory. I'm pretty sure it's probably not right. But you know that we, the Earth has apparently had different asteroids that have flown by us, and apparently several of them have hit the Earth, and they're called extinction events. One of them necessitated the Ice Age and all that. Well, 
I don't know if I believe in those extinction events. I believe in one extinction event for sure. It's called the flood. Um, but uh, these giant asteroids apparently have flown by and passed by the Earth, not between the sun and the Earth, but between the moon and the Earth. Giant ones that could be extinction events. So I have this theory that maybe a long, real skinny asteroid that goes on for miles and miles and miles passes between the moon and the Earth just close enough to blot out the sun for three long hours. And probably when it passed by because of gravity, it may have created some earthquake kind of stuff. Okay, I have no idea if that happened. I have no idea of that. But I know that the Bible's true. Let's keep reading. So, noon till three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land, all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus felt God forsaken at that moment because he took the sin of the world into his body on the tree. And when some were standing there, they heard this and they said, he's calling for Elijah. Why did they say he's calling for Elijah? Because Elijah comes before the great and terrible day of the Lord. These events that are starting to unpack in this context remind us of something. Let's find out what it reminds us of in a little bit. Verse 48. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it up with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, offered it to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, now leave him alone and let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks split and the tombs broke open. And the body of many holy people who had died were raised to life. And they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection. So this last part, these bodies come out of the tomb, and this happens after the resurrection. But the writer is, is mentioning. Now, I know some of you as kids have played uh, Minecraft or Plants and Zombies. Uh, <laughs> zombies are like nothing. This, this, is, this is real stuff. This, this would be quite something else. So they... After the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now back to the crucifixion scene, verse 54. And when the centurion, military guy, trained in how to kill people, trained in torturously how to kill people, and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, <laughs> Roman guard, friend. Some people say, oh, it's just a Jewish guard. No. Roman centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened. They were terrified. These are people trained for war, trained in torture. They were scared to death and they exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Not Caesar is Lord. Not Caesar is Lord. Not, not I'm going to die if I do something wrong here at this guard. This guy is the son of God. Why did they have that feeling? What, what came over them? I'll tell you what it was. At the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the events that we just read about here, I believe they're experiencing a prequel of the end of the world. For real. For real. Uh, it's the end of the world. The light is out. It's complete darkness. There's an earthquake. There's no place to stand. Anything you trust is crumbling. You can't find your feet. There's no place to go but to Jesus Christ alone. And time is running out. And they don't know there's going to be a history. They're thinking, this is it. We are undone. It's over. The graves are opening, for crying out loud. Dead people are coming out. This, <laughs> You see what I'm saying here about it being like a prequel of the end of the world? And in a way, friends, I really believe it was a prequel of the very end of the world. You see, Jesus Christ, who spoke the world into existence and is the light of the world, was going out. The light of the world was going out. And that which holds it together was starting to shake like the song we sang about, everything is shaking, but my house is built on Jesus, who is the rock. And should the sun forbear to shine, 
still I'm going to be trusting in Jesus. These are not just metaphors. They're metaphors that represent a reality that is actually bigger than the metaphor itself. So Jesus is the victor. I want to tell you, take a little uh, excursus here. So it's kind of a three-point thrown in at the side. I think that there are people that have regrets. I don't want to live with regrets, and I don't want you to live with regrets either. Okay? Well, then I want to talk about just one of the people that possibly had some regrets here, and that is Pontius Pilate. We know he had some regret immediately after the, after the trial, right? He washed his hands. He washed his hands to say, I'm innocent of this man's blood. He wasn't innocent of the blood. He feared Caesar. The religious leader said, hey, if you let him go, you're no friend of Caesar's. And he, uh, you know, initiated the, the crucifixion. But I believe that he may have had regrets about that because that which he thought he was saving, his own life and maybe the reputation of Rome and the Roman Empire, where is it today? Pilate is dead. Where is the Roman Empire today? It's gone. The Roman Empire, I mean, there will be a revived Roman Empire in the last days. But for the last hundreds and hundreds of years, no Roman Empire. It's down. The Huns, the barbarians took it over and overran. What about the Jewish leaders? I think the Jewish leaders had regrets. Think of it. You've got to instigate your, your religious clientele to cry out for a crucifixion of an innocent man. That's going to come back and bite you. You tell your religious people, this is the way you show your morality, crying out for the crucifixion of an innocent man. And then what happens? You know, well, then they got to have a trial by night that's illegal, and they got to cover that up. I don't, want to, don't tell Joseph Arimathea about it. Don't tell Nicodemus about it. Doing, you got to cover that up. And then you got to get a, a bribe from one of his followers, you know, Judas, and get 30 pieces of silver. So now you're in that kind of corruption. Well, you got to cover up that corruption. Hopefully, you've got a friendly press that's going to work for you. Because once you start telling the lies, you got to put lies upon lies upon lies to cover it up so that you still are very holy. Very, uh, we're very holy. And then after the resurrection, they got to bribe the guards, and the word gets out that you bribe the guards to tell a story that they stole the body. Yeah, fishermen stole the body from Roman soldiers. Yeah, and I'm thinking they had some regrets. And by the way, where is their blessed temple today? I mean, the temple is the center of the law, the Day of Atonement. It's right in the middle of the Torah. And is there a temple today? There's not been any sacrifices for sin for years, not since 70 A.D. The whole thing got destroyed. Everything they sought to clutch and to gain and to hoard and to misuse their power, they lost it all, just like the Roman Empire, just like Roman authority, just like our lives when we seek to be controllers and hoarders as well. We have to be people of worship and praise that are generous with good news. We need to be people of good news that our face looks like we believe good news as well. And not just, oh yeah, yeah, I gotta be a happy person. And you know, you know, if somebody passed away, somebody told me this morning that her father father died and prayed with her and you, you don't go, oh yeah, your father died. I don't mean like that stupid stuff. I just mean people that are filled with the Spirit of God and the joy of the Lord and the confidence that He has conquered death and the grave and sin in our life as well and is conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. It's the only, only way to live. Now I want to tell you about another regret. And this one's maybe a little bit more far-fetched, but I think the devil had regret. Um, maybe you can put that, that passage up for us, um, Brian. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, verses 7 and 8. And uh, it reads like this. For we declare God's wisdom. Isn't this great? This is the gospel. God's wisdom. A mystery that has been hidden. How so is it hidden? Well, it's prophesied in the Old Testament right from the very beginning. Both the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the second coming of Christ as well. It's all revealed, but we, we miss it because we're not searching the scriptures it's hidden, but God in his time will reveal it through the Holy Spirit. And God, God destined this good news, this wisdom for our glory before time began. And then it has this little phrase, none of the rulers of this age understood it. So what are the rulers of this age? Is it talking about Pilate? Is it talking about the Roman Empire? Is it talking about Jewish leaders? 
It's talking about all of us, right? <laughs> Anybody with power. Um, it's like the old spiritual is correct. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Yes, we're, we were complicit in it as well. But I think he's talking here in this text, excuse me, about principalities and powers, demonic forces, demonic spirits. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I believe Satan helped incite that crowd to cry for blood. But I don't think he knew, as C.S. Lewis talks about in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the deeper magic, that what God had intended, that the cross was going to be the place where Satan's own works would be destroyed, where he would be defeated, where death, his domain, would be overturned, where the grave would be overturned, where forgiveness of sins could be meted out to people that were already under Satan's domain. He wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have done this if he knew it was going to turn out the way it turned out. And aren't you glad it did? <laughs> Well, I think that there are people who someday are going to regret playing at religion. You know what I mean? Playing church, churchianity, playing, playing at religious games. You know, I want to date with that lady there, but she goes to church, so I'm going to go to church, so she will go out with me. These are games that people play. It's, it's the same old classic thing of getting pulled over for the cops because you're you're going seven miles over the speed limit. You thought you had five, but you knew you were actually going ten, and you lucked out that they only clocked you at seven. But when they heard the siren going, you say, oh, God, if you get me out of this, I promise I will not speed again. I promise I'll at least not here. I won't, pro I won't be speeding through this children's zone with the deaf kid. I, I promise I won't be speeding through the playground. Uh, just get me out of just this one more time, and I'll serve you forever and of course you don't because you're playing at religion you're trying to bargain with God trying to put God in a position where he can't uh, reasonably say no we got to get past um, a life of living with regrets and playing at religion we need to be authentic before Jesus Christ the living God our only hope and our only savior to tell you a, a account briefly time is running out I want to tell you briefly about, I think I have a little graphic on that. I want to tell you a story about a guy named uh, William Borden. Uh, he was a, uh, oh, that clock is fun. Uh, um, Borden of Yale, young man from a very rich family, turn of the century, 100 years ago. Um, you know what he got for his 16th birthday? You know, some people think that would be a sweet thing if I turned 16, my parents would buy me a car. I never had resources to do that. Maybe a used car, not by today's standards. <laughs> Try to find a good used car. Um, it's going to cost you some cash. No, young Borden of Yale's parents bought him a trip around the world at age 16. Wasn't that sweet? We're talking about a sincere rich kid here. But when he made the trip around the world, he started noticing people in different cultures that were broken and were needy and were lost, just like his own culture. And he decided at that time that he was going to be a super wealthy entrepreneur. No, actually, he decided he was going to become a missionary. And this totally frosted the parents. And they hoped he would grow out of it. Um, but when he graduated from high school, he went to Yale. Yale hyper ideological liberalism and leftism yale was harder than heck to find a christian fellowship or even harder hard to find a christian or two but he went there and you know he started a prayer partnership with a student and then another student and then another student and at the end of his four years at yale there were over a thousand five hundred students at yale having prayer partnerships and prayer meetings with each other and he made good on his promise. At the end of his graduation, he went to missions, and he wanted to minister amongst Muslims. And he wanted to minister to Muslims in China. And so he sailed, because back then you couldn't fly, and you couldn't do a, a FaceTime, and you couldn't do a Facebook Live, and you couldn't do a, a Skype. When you went to the mission field, it took you a long time to get there because you had to get on a boat and you had to sail. And he sailed to Egypt to learn to speak Arabic, to speak to Muslims in China in their own language. And while he was in Egypt, he got meningitis. 
but he made good on his promise and he sailed to China with meningitis. And when he reached the field, just before he got, he got there, he died of meningitis. And the world was a tiz about what a waste, waste of a fortune, a waste of a mind, waste of a life. In the back of his Bible, they found th these three, three little phrases written. No reserve, no retreat, no regret. Isn't that amazing? No reserve, no retreat, no regret. He didn't have any reserve. He didn't hold out anything from the Lord. He gave it all. His time, his talent, his treasure, his hospitality, his learning, his willingness to pray with other people. Um, he didn't retreat from the calling that he had at the age of 16. He pursued it to the very end. And even though he didn't get on the field itself, he knew that he gave the totality of his life to the, everything that he knew of himself, to everything that he knew of Jesus. And he did not have any regrets about it. I believe that that's the way God wants us to live our lives as well. And the time is running out. The clock wasn't just a joke. It's speeding up, and we are getting closer and closer to Jesus coming. I wouldn't be, I'm not a date setter, and I'm not liquidating my savings account. I wouldn't be surprised if he's here before the end of the year. I wouldn't be surprised if he came this afternoon. And you know what? If he comes, I'm going to say, even so come, Lord Jesus. I'm so happy to see you. And, uh, but I, I just want to say, Tom says, don't get ready, be ready. What he means by that is, it's not that you do works to prepare your prepperdom. It's that you bow the knee and turn to him and trust him for forgiveness, for a new life, for a transformation that only he can give so that you can live your life with no retreat and no reserve and no regrets and full of joy and hope and peace because he is the Savior, the only Savior, and every place else is shaky and God takes the initiative before he destroys that temple through the Romans in 70 AD he makes sure they know that from God's initiative in heaven he parts that curtain so the people can get into the holy of holies and have access directly to direct fellowship with God without any mediator because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and because Jesus conquered death we can call him Abba we can just crawl up in his lap and call him Lord through the Holy Spirit because he reveals the Father perfectly to us. He reveals the Father perfectly to us. Let's stand. We're going to have a closing closing song, but I want to give you an opportunity. If you've never trusted this Jesus personally, or you have trusted him, but you've been living your life in a slow, dull, tor torturous, um, backslidden, posing, playing at religion, suicide, to give a chance to turn around and just give your life full on to Christ. He is worthy of all of your life. So I'm going to pray, and if you'd like to come forward, there'll be some people who are willing to pray with you. If you've never accepted the Lord, please do that. Don't leave here today without knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've drifted and you want to be refilled with this Holy Spirit, come on down and ask for people to pray for you about that too. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for James. We thank you for his converted life. We thank you for Saul and his converted life to the Apostle Paul. We thank you for what you've done in some of our lives as well. We thank you for new hope. We thank you for new joy. We thank you for power and witness. We thank you, Father, for meaning and value and purpose. And we pray that everyone that we know and touch and get a chance to witness to would be able to live their lives full on for you, full on for you, with no retreat, no reserve, and no regrets. In Jesus' name, let's keep in the attitude of praise. And if you'd like to come forward for prayer, do so. And you can go ahead and lead us, friend.